God for you all and for this opportunity to speak to the church. I'd like to thank my dear wife who has helped me to be able to connect and speak to you. I would like to take two scripture readings from the Blessed Bible, the King James Version. The first scripture is Leviticus 25, verse 9. Then shall thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound. I want to emphasize the word sound because my title is going to be Resonance. Then shall I cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the Day of Atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Brother Ben Bienvenu Thank you for this honor. My title again, Resonance from the word Resonate. My theme is going to be, does it ring a bell? My second scripture is Revelation 10, verse 7. A scripture pertaining to the hour we live in, the last and seventh church age, and thereafter the Lord Jesus comes for his bride. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, watch that word again, when he shall begin to sound. There's that word again, sound, resonate, resonance, does it ring a bell? The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. I am not a student of sound waves, but the little bit I know is that the dictionary says to resonate or resonance means deep sound. I want you to notice not shallow, deep sound. Secondly, clear sound. Because Paul says if the trumpet makes an uncertain unclear sound who will be prepared second meaning is clear sound third meaning sound filled with images memories and emotions now when i read my opening scripture Leviticus 25 verse 9 I ought to have asked you the question does it ring a bell? How so? Because Leviticus says on the 10th day of the 7th month that's already 10 7 does that ring a sound? Do you see why we went to Revelation 10, 7? You see, these trumpets in the land of Israel were not sounded the same way. They were not all on the same decibel. For instance, the trumpets that 
announced the Sabbath were blown a certain way so that the people could decipher from the sound it made that it is not a sound for preparation for war, but preparation for the Sabbath. Then if the king desired to speak to the nation, they then sounded the trumpets a certain way so that the people knew it's not for the Sabbath, the king wants to speak. Then the scripture we read is on the 50th, or rather on the Day of Atonement, I beg your pardon, they understood that now we must head toward the temple in Jerusalem. But there was yet another sounding of these trumpets on the 50th year, the trumpet would sound a certain way and they would then decipher that it's not the Sabbath preparation, it's not the king wants to speak to us, it's not prepare for war, but this one is to say, you are free. Now one hour ten minutes will not be enough for me to cover all the aspects of resonance, but I will try. Sometimes in life, as well as in the gospel, things are not as they sound. I'll give an example and listen very carefully. Things are not always as they sound. A farmer has 10 sheep. Four are died. How many remain? A farmer has 10 sheep. Four are died. How many remain? Somebody says, six remain. You didn't hear me right. I did not say, four are dead. I said, four are died, another color. So how many remain? It is still 10. There I have proved that we could be listening to the same preacher and evening and even be listening to the same end time prophet and then come out with different understandings. Here's another one before we go very deep. A woman gives birth to twins. Boy twins. Same hospital. Same everything. But she comes from a poor background, so she hasn't been able to give them any birthday party. So when they reach 20, one is 20 and the other twin is 22. Now I have your mind racing. I have your mind running because of the first example. How can they be twins? And when they reach 20, one is 20 and the other one is 22. Things are not as they sound. This is not 22. This is 20. T-O-O. -O. Remember they are twins. So with these two examples, I have your attention now. You are saying to yourself, I had better sit back, clear my ears, and make sure I'm listening carefully. 
our blessed Lord Jesus, whom we love, adore, and worship, said in Matthew 7, 13, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way. If you ever look into that scripture, straight is not the way you heard him. Because straight in Matthew 7.13 is spelled S-T-R-A-I-T. Not straight, but straight as the Strait of Gibraltar, meaning water. Straight means water. 5809-28, baptism of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus wasn't talking about a natural gate that runs in a straight line. He was talking of a deeper gate that we come through water baptism, that's where you start. That's why Peter said in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. After repentance, the first thing you do is water baptism. Thereafter you go through your justification, syndication, and then he shall give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So even in the Bible, straight can have two meanings. Yes, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ expects us to walk a straight path. But over here, straight is the gate. That's why we don't so much depend on the five senses of the body, which are C. Sometimes what you see is not really what it is. We don't depend on smell. It can be deceptive. We don't depend on hearing. No taste, no feel. That's why faith is that sixth element. It's beyond the five senses of the body. And it is also beyond the five senses of the spirit, which are... Imagination, conscience, memory, reason, and affection. You cannot trust these five senses of the body and the five senses of the spirit. Faith is what we trust, but we use these five gates of the body and the five gates of the spirit because we live in this dimension of matter and time. Space, matter, time. So, faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word. So yes, you do need to hear right. You do need to see right, but don't depend on that. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to transport you to the level of the word <coughs> where God wants you to be. Allow me to use the example of the electric lawnmower. And this comes from a personal experience. I was mowing the lawn back in South Africa, summertime. The lawnmower was at its loudest. And before I knew it, that attacked. Why? Later I was told by those who keep bees that the lawnmower, a certain type of lawnmower, produces a certain sound which the bees in the area interpret it as another colony of bees that is coming to attack them. Resonance. The lawnmower was making a sound that attracted the bees, the fighter bees, 
who will then attack the lawnmower and the one behind the lawnmower as an enemy that was coming against their nest. That is why in 1 Chronicles 14 and 15, God says to David, don't make a move until you hear the sound in the mulberry trees. Do you see that word sound, mulberry trees? God is so specific. He says, because there are other trees around the mulberry trees, e.g., maybe the pine tree is growing along there, the palm tree, and in Africa, the baobab, and all the other trees. When wind runs through all the other trees, they each make an individual sound with their leaves. But God says, don't move until you hear the sound going through the mulberry trees. In other words, we understand why Paul says, there are many voices today in the last days. Oh my goodness. Especially out there and now, even in the realms of the message of the hour. So many sounds. But those who are well trained by the end time prophet, the Bible and the message, will not make a move until they identify whether it be that sound that we heard through this vindicated prophet of Malachi 4, Luke 17, 30, Revelation 3, 14, Revelation 10, 7, and many, many other scriptures. If it does not line up with that sound, then it is not the sound in the mulberry trees. It is not the sound in the mulberry trees. Now I'm going to take you a little deeper into the scriptures. When you read Genesis 16 verse 5, Sarah sounds like she is rebuking her husband, Abraham. It is after Abraham had fibbed, had said she is my sister. You read the story, but I'm interested in the sound of these words. When she said to Abraham, my wrong be upon thee. You see, naturally you would say, I understand it to mean, whatever we've gone through, I blame you. That's when you hear it with a natural ear. But however, there is another sound it makes. It's a deeper sound. It's a clear sound. It's a higher sound. You see, the husband types Christ to the wife. Sarah prophesied of our greater husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. My wrong as the church be upon thee as the husband. And the Bible says Christ took upon himself all our wrongs. That is why there is no other savior than the Lord Jesus Christ. All the other religions and their founders, none of them has ever died and risen. Maybe they have died, but none of them has ever risen. Only one died, was buried and rose again. Only one said, no man takes my life away from me, but I lay it willingly down for the sheep. So Sarah prophesied deeper sound, deeper meaning. Here's another example. In Exodus 4 and verse 25, it's again husband and wife altercation. 
Moses has been so busy, he has not circumcised his own son. According to the law and the covenant of Abraham that God gave to Abraham and said, and all your seed after you must observe. Here is Moses, leader of the people, prophet of the Exodus, yet his own son is not yet circumcised. Then we are told that Zipporah took a sharp stone, a flint, and Zipporah did what no other woman ever did, because in the law, it was then given to the priests and the high priests especially to do the circumcision at the temple. She then circumcised the foreskin of the boy, the Bible says, and tossed it at the feet of Abram and said, Thou art a bloody husband to me. That's what you're hearing. And to prove that we need resonance, we need a deeper understanding of what we hear, she was not cursing her husband. She was not belittling Moses. She was prophesying that the circumcision of the heart by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, will come when our greater husband Christ sheds his blood on Calvary and today we look back on that day on Calvary and we see our bloody husband. The one who shed his blood for us. Can you see what I'm trying to share with you? Resonance. Does it ring a bell? So when you read Sarah, it must ring a bell. Christ. When you read about Zipporah, it must ring a bell. Christ, because the prophet says, if you read the Bible and you do not see Jesus Christ, the prophet says, read again. We go a little further. This incident happened when I was touring with message believers in the land of Israel some years ago. We were in a little town called Arad, A-R-A-D. Arad was a Philistine king in those days. It's a long story, I'll make it short. I was first at the breakfast table in that little hotel and I had this very same Bible you see here. I was preparing for the day and the tour and what to say at different sites. And there was an Arab man who was setting the tables. And curiosity got the better of him and he came next to me and he said, what is that you are reading? I said, it's the Bible. He says, I've never seen it in all my life. He said, why is it black on the outside? I says, no, the color doesn't matter. They sometimes come in red covers or green covers, whatever, gray. But he says, why is yours black? Without thinking, I remember the scripture that said, take no thought what you shall say. I said, because it's white on the inside. And he chuckled a bit. He then changed the subject and said, where are you reading? I said, well, I'm in Genesis 22. He says, what does it say there? I says, this is where God says to Abraham, take thine son, thine only son. And before I could proceed, he said, aha, he must have taken Ishmael. I said, no, sir. He took Isaac. He says, that's wrong. Your Bible is wrong. His only son at that time, his only son. I said, wait a minute, sir. It is not how you hear the reading. He said, what do you mean? He put down the broom and he listened. I said, you see, Abram had two sons under two names. He says, I've never heard that before. I said, I'm sure you did. 
It's just that you don't know what the application is. He says, go on. I said, when he was Abram, he had Ishmael. That was his only son as Abram. His eyes narrowed. I said, and then when God changed his name to Abraham, he had another son, Isaac. So he had a son under the old name, Abram, Ishmael. Then he had a son under the new name, Abraham, he had Isaac. He says, where are you going to with this? I said, now, listen to the sound of God's word. He called him by his new name. He said, Abraham, take now thine only son. He picked up his broom and he walked away. I believe he caught it. You see, it's resonance. It's the same as when Isaac says, Father, I see the knife in your hand, Genesis 22. I see the fire in your other hand. I'm carrying the wood. We are going up a mountain to build an altar, but where is the sacrifice? Abraham, hallelujah, watch that resonance. Abraham picks up in the spirit realm and he prophesies and he says the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. What a double meaning. When you read it in the natural, God will provide a ram. Yes, they found a ram. But when you take it higher in, does it ring a bell? The Lord on Calvary will provide himself a sacrifice. That's why Jesus Christ was not a second person of the Godhead. It was God himself providing himself as a sacrifice for our sins. You see, when you read Exodus 2 verse 2, you'll come, you'll come across this line. That when Moses was born, they observed that he was a goodly child. Maybe I should read it verbatim so that in case somebody is listening who is not a Bible reader can get the exact wording. Exodus 2 verse 2, and the woman conceived, that's Jochebed, and bare a son. And when she saw him, Moses, that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. That word, goodly child, if you look at your King James Version or Schofield, Thompson's chain reference, you will notice that the word goodly child, the child is in italics. It is because in Joshua 10, 13, 2 Samuel 1, 18, the Bible urges you to read the book of Jesha. Joshua 10, 13, 2 Samuel 1, 18, read the book of Jesha. By grace, I have this book in English. And that very verse, Goodly child is translated from she saw the pillar of fire over the child. Hallelujah! No wonder Deuteronomy 18 18, speaking of Jesus Christ, says, I shall raise up a prophet like you, Moses. And when Christ was born, the Bible says a star came and hung over him. If you thought it was a star as the ones you have in the universe, you've missed it because those don't come down and hang over a child. It was the pillar of fire that was among those stars. I'm going to go deeper, see, with resonance. That's why when the end time prophet, the vessel and the body through which God is going to reveal himself again, as promised in Luke 17, 30. 
the pillar of fire appeared over William Brenham. Goodly child, Moses. Christ Jesus, goodly child. William Brenham, goodly child. The sequence and precision of scripture is most amazing. Let's move on. You read in Exodus 28.35 that Moses or Aaron the high priest when he went into the holiest of holies his tunic his dress as the high priest way down toward the hem of his garment toward the feet there were supposed to be bells pomegranate in shape we know it was because when the high priest goes into the holies of holies only he can go in there so when he moves about to serve at the mercy seat the ark and the wings of the angels when they hear the sound they know he's alive but there is another deeper meaning that's my point. It was ring a bell. <laughs> pomegranate bells must ring a bell. Why did God say pomegranate? Why not apple? Why not pear? Why not orange? Why not tangela or tangerine? Why pomegranate specifically? It is because any healthy full-grown pomegranate when you open it and you count the seeds the total is always 613 613 what's the significance brother George is because when you read throughout all scripture the total amount of the laws of God not only the Ten Commandments you include them all the other commandments that says thou shalt not thou shalt thou shalt not the total amount is 613 six one three so it was a reminder that when those bells were making a sound it was also reminding the high priest it's not only so that the ones outside may hear i'm, I'm alive but it is to remind me as the high priest that there are laws that I must also keep. That's why God is specific. He didn't say goat bell, Swiss cow bell, stock exchange bell, ice cream van bell. He says pomegranate bells. This is the point I'm making. That things don't always sound and end up on the natural level God always has a deeper meaning. Can you hear that sound? To those who follow this blessed message of the hour that I adore and live by, from the time that I heard it early in 1973 till 2020, God have mercy, I do not want to move an inch to the left nor to the right, but stay dead center with this message. If you punch in the words on your message table, kosher, plate, middle, a quote comes up from 5709.22, Hebrews chapter 7, where the prophet says, if there's any Jew here, on that kosher plate, there are three breads that they put there, and they don't break the top bread nor the bottom bread but they take the middle bread and break it and christ is revealed in that because the prophet says hallelujah he couldn't die as a pillar of fire under the fatherhood he cannot die as the holy spirit today but when he became the middle person the middle bread then they could break the cell of blood on Calvary. I once asked a Jew, a rabbi, I said, why do you have those three breads? He says, I don't know. 
We follow tradition. Today you know. Today it rings a bell. That is the three offices of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I asked the rabbi before I move on. I said, Rabbi, I've never seen those breads on the kosher plate. He says, well, it's under a certain feast that we have them. I said, tell me, Rabbi, do you put those breads one, two, three next to each other? He says, no, 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 no. That will break tradition. I was interested. I said, so how do you have those breads? He says, one on top of each other so that the eye can see them as one. And I cried out, hallelujah. The rabbi was startled. He said, why, why the excitement? I said, you just said it. That the three breads must be placed one on top of the other so that they make one bread. I said, the office of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one God. They stack them on top of each other. They don't put them next to each other. If they put them next to each other, that makes the Trinity. But when they put them on top of each other, it ties with the entire scriptures. That the Father became the Son, the Son became the Holy Spirit. So all three, it's one. Not three personalities in the Godhead. One personality in three offices. I'm a father, I'm a son to my parents, and I'm a pastor to a church. Am I three persons? No. It's three offices I hold. A father to my children, a son to my parents, and a pastor to the church, it doesn't make me three individuals. That is why in Leviticus 11, go and read it. It's the dietary laws of the Old Testament. Kosherut, kashrut, from where the word kosher comes from. Kosherut, kashrut. They were to eat certain animals and not eat other animals, if you end up there with that sound, you just end up with dietary laws on the table. But there's a deeper meaning. God says, I allow you to eat the ones that divide the hoof, divide the hoof, and regurgitate, chew up the cud. What is the deeper meaning? Does it ring a bell? Yes, to me it does. In 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul says, rightly divide the word of God and give attendance to reading. You read, you chew, you think about it. There's your split hoof brother who can divide, hallelujah, error from truth, truth from error. And after he reads the word, he goes home and regurgitates. After he hears a sermon, he goes home and thinks about it. So those animals were a symbol of what a true Christian should be. That is why in Acts chapter 10, Peter feels hungry. God tests Peter. He shows him all the animals that were forbidden. The voice of God says, eat them. Peter is still an old Jew now. Though he has received the Holy Ghost, the transition from the law to grace is still in process. He says, Lord, I've never eaten those unclean things. And God says, don't you call unclean what I have cleansed? Because this is after Calvary. As soon as he comes out of the vision, Gentiles are knocking at the door. You see, the animals were forbidden to eat were a symbol of Gentiles that Jews were not to fellowship with. But after Calvary, the middle wall of partition is broken down. After Calvary, there's no more black, white, brown, yellow. We are all brothers and sisters. Bless the Lord. In Genesis 37, watch resonance. Does it ring a bell? When Joseph's brothers return, they know they have sold him to the Ishmaelites. It's a family thing, you know. Because the Ishmaelites descend from Ishmael. 
Ishmael, who was one of the sons of, <laughs> of Abraham. Is it not amazing that certain things that happen, and I'm not going to be too blatant, certain things that happen even in the message community, they are all family matters. They are all message community issues. So here they are, the sons of Jacob, they sell one of their brothers to the Ishmaelites relative. That's why if you read your Bible, the politics of the Middle East will not stumble you. When Syria and Lebanon fight Israel, go back to scripture. Abram dwelt in Syria many years before God moved him down to the south. Rebekah came from Lebanon, Laban, Laban, Liban. They are all relatives. So sometimes when they have their infights, you step back and pray. That's why in the message today, sometimes Simeon, who was known to have a violent temper, will rise up against Zebulun. You read me between the lines. Sometimes the very sons of Jacob will have it for each other. You just step back and pray. It's family issues. However, the sons of Jacob then killed a goat and dip the coat in blood to make it look like he was killed by an animal. And indeed, Jacob cries out when he sees the coat, he says, an evil beast has devoured him. Watch, that's what you hear. But he was prophesying because through Jacob, Israel would come a Messiah. And there you go. And when that Messiah was crucified, who crucified him? Rome did. The Roman soldiers did. Read your book of Revelation. The beast killed our Joseph. But take it a little higher. Our sins killed him. But who did the actual killing? An evil beast has devoured him. Does it ring a bell? Everything in the Old Testament, if it does not point to Christ, read again. Here are two scriptures that I'm going to read before I wind down. And the scriptures you know very well. When I say the famous words of Ruth, everybody knows them, Ruth 1.16. And Ruth said, And treat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where you die, I will die. Where they bury you, there I will be buried. Very famous words from a woman that we respect. But very few people don't know that these words have a resonance like an echo. You know that an echo does not make itself. You say something, it hits against something and reverberates, comes back. Do you know there's an echo of these words? In 2 Samuel 15, 21, 2 Samuel 15, 21, Itai the Gittite. Why is he called the Gittite? Because a Gittite is a dweller of Gath, G-A-T-H, where Goliath of Gath came from. Can you believe that after David killed Goliath, there were Philistines that saw the anointing on David and followed David? Here's one of them, Itai from Gath. Itai the Gittite said to the king, as the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, surely in what place my king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also shall thy servant be. Can you see the words of Ruth repeated by Itai the Gittite? It's called resonance, echo. 
Can we safely say before I'm going to close that we are faithful re-sounders of the same message? I know we're all trying our best. I'm just talking to somebody out there. I'm not saying there aren't people who are doing their best to resound the same message. There are plenty all over the world. But in case, just in case you are not, the scriptures challenge you. This word needs you to resound. Why? Because in Revelation 10, after John eats the book, from verse 8 to 11, he is told, go back and prophesy again. There you go. So that the spirit and the bride can say the same thing. There you go. Resonance. The spirit and the bride say, come. Eat this book and you will speak exactly as the book speaks. Listen to the tapes of this end time prophet and you will speak the same. Quickly, Second Chronicles 5.13. Do you know Solomon lined up his musicians and trumpeters? Not many people are aware that 10 chapters later, I beg your pardon, 1 Chronicles 15.25, this is 2 Chronicles 5.13, but in 1 Chronicles 15, 2, 3, 4, and 5, the Bible tells you how many they were, these trumpeters. Are you ready? A hundred and twenty. Aha! It rings a bell, Pastor Martin. It rings a bell. How many were they? A hundred and twenty. Does not that speak of Pentecost? Yes. Acts 2. How many were they in the upper room? A hundred and twenty. When you read 2 Chronicles 5, 13, it says all 120 made one sound. You go to Acts chapter 2, there came a sound, not sounds, a sound singular like of a mighty rushing wind. Can you see? The trumpeters of Solomon's days were talking of the sound that the Holy Ghost made in the upper room. And let me drop a bomb. It's the same Holy Spirit we saw operating in the life of the end time beloved vindicated prophet William Branham. I want that spirit that was in that William Branham because I see Christ in it. If anybody else comes claiming Holy Ghost and Holy Ghost and they behave differently, sorry, it does not resonate for me. Folks, I'm going to close in a little while. I've got 10 minutes before my hour is done. I say a lot of things in one hour. What somebody else can say in three, God has given me grace to say it in one hour. Because I believe in the message of the hour. Folks, let another man be what he is. I'm not saying... Change your style and be a one-hour preacher. I am me and you are you. God bless you. Matthew 18 verse 6. Jesus in the parable speaks of a woman. A woman, church. That took flour, Christ. Kneaded it. And made one lump. Watch. Woman, church. Took flour, Christ netted it and made one lump but don't miss don't miss Matthew 13 and 33 there is another woman church also took flour yes but the scripture says and kept it apart in three measures there you go it sounded the same woman woman flower flower and then if you're not careful, you think because it sounds the same, it's the same thing. No, read carefully. The one netted it and made it one. Office of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. The other one took the same thing and kept it as three separate. Does it ring a bell who does that today? Revelation 17 
And also Revelation chapter 18. See, it must ring a bell. Watch, Matthew 22, 19. They say to Jesus, should we pay taxes? They are trying to pit Jesus against the government of his day. He answers them wisely. He says, show me the coin that's in your hand. They show him the coin. He says, whose superinscription is on it? Whose image is on it? Image. See, we are going to deeper. Image. Jesus' point was not only pay tax. He says, I'm taking it deeper. Whose image is on the coin? They said, Caesar they said, give to Caesar his image, but give to God. What belongs to God. He's not only talking of tithes now. He's saying whose image. Give it back to Caesar. But then give to God the image too. And the Bible says in Hebrews 1.3. Christ. The express image of God. So Christ wasn't saying pay your taxes. Sure you should. He was saying let's take this thing a little deeper. If the image is Caesar. Who am I? I'm the image of God. I should be imprinted on your lives. Oh, resonance, my brother. Does it ring a bell? Quickly now, time doesn't allow me to go through all the quotes, but I've got eight minutes, I'll try. Punch in the words on your message table. Restaurant tip. You know to tip? Restaurant tip. Waitress disgrace. A quote comes up where the prophet says, and it's as though he was looking at 2020, where you are indirectly forced to give 10% of the entire account. 10% of the bill. I don't know who is enforcing it, but it's become almost expected. And the prophet says, it's a disgrace. He says, why? Because I give my tithes to God. But he goes deeper in 1959, 5.25, in the message, Images of Christ, you punch in the words, Harvest, 10th, Elected, Ages. A quote comes up where the prophet reveals one of the deepest mysteries, and I find it only in this quote. He says, the bride at the end will be one-tenth of all the elect that's ever lived throughout the ages. Oh, hallelujah. So when I give my tenth to God, it doesn't end there. It's not money leaving my pocket. I am actually declaring a deeper truth that by giving it, I'm not buying a ticket to heaven, but I'm testifying that I'm part of that one-tenth elect. Resonance. That's why if you read and you don't see Christ, read again. Hallelujah, read again. That's why Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast, watch, the form of sound words. Sound words will make a form. The message of the hour will make a form so that you can be transformed. The power of transformation cannot just happen and you are empty. This Bible must be imbibed. This Bible must become you and me. The message of the hour must become us. So that the power of the Holy Spirit, when the dynamics strike the mechanics, there will be a change. Oh, brother, I'm closing. You know, Esau amazes me. <clears throat> In Genesis 27, 34, he cries out. He says to his father, Bless me even now. Bless me even now. He cried. He says, bless me. Why? Jacob has stolen my blessing. Now my father Isaac, bless me. You see, he knew and he lived long enough. In the household of Abram. 
and Isaac. He knew very well their form, their lifestyles, their behavior, but he only wanted the blessings of it. Listen before I close. He wasn't interested in keeping the requirements. He just wanted the blessing. He says, bless me, but he has just sold his birthright, but he wants a blessing. Watch now. That's why Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Obey not only in my presence. Obey even though I'm not there. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So Esau lived long enough with Abraham and Isaac to adopt their ways of living, but no revelation. Yes, many can sit for many years in message churches adopt the habits of the message and still have no revelation. Make sure that when you hear the word, you hear the tapes, there's a resonance. That's why the prophet says, in why I'm against organized religion. He says, watch that angel of Revelation 18.1 when he speaks on earth. His message is echoed in heaven. There's a resonance. That's why in 1962, 12, 30, says, is this the time? He says, don't pay any attention to the messenger, but watch his message. He's not saying disrespect me. He's saying, don't miss the resonance of my message. Watch. We just told you a while ago how Moses and Zipporah bickered, had a quarrel over an uncircumcised son. You know the life and ministry of William Branham had all these multiple ministries in them. You can see Elijah, you can see Elisha, though Elisha types a bride, yes. When the prophet prayed for that boy who died at work, he says, I put my face in his face, my hands over his hand, I prayed and he revived. Elisha did that. You can see the ministry of John the Baptist in him. You can see ultimately the ministry of Jesus Christ. So watch, you can also see the ministry of Abraham. Watch. And Moses. Moses had a bickering with Zipporah over a son. Brother Branham had a bickering with his wife, Sister Midi, over Joseph. The incident where she slammed the door in his face. It's scriptural. I'm not saying all the sisters must smash or slam the doors in their husband's faces. What scripture are you fulfilling? I'm pointing to a messenger. Don't you know? Zipporah means flying off the handle or a flying bird. And there's Sister Midi flying off into the room and locking herself up. Abram and Sarah, watch. Abram and Sarah physically impossible to have a son. Do you know that Sister Midi had two caesareans? When she had Rebecca and Sarah, they said, no more possible to have a child. Can't you see God put our Sister Midi in the very same position as Sarah and the prophet being Abraham? And God then said, I will give you a son. Like God said to Abraham, I'll give you a son, even though it's impossible. And Isaac came. And in the case of the prophet, our brother Joseph came. Oh my goodness. Scripture! Jacob sees the face of God as he wrestles with a man. And he calls the place Peniel. I have seen the face of God. That's before he enters the promise. Here we are today, the cloud of 1963. We see the face of God as a man in the cloud. We see our pineal before our bodies are transformed to get to the other side. Folks, there's always a lot to see. Moses had to bring them to Mount Sinai. William Branham brought us by revelation to Mount Sunset. Moses at Mount Sinai gave them the law. William Branham says in unveiling of God, 1964, 
paragraph 300. He says, Moses brought the commandments. He stops and he says, the seals were brought in. He's running a parallel resonance. Does it ring a bell? He's running a parallel that Moses brought them to a mountain for commandments. I brought you to Mount Sunset for the entire revelation of the word. Folks, Israel as a nation is my last point. There is great debate among us. And I'm saying this respectfully. Perhaps somebody will be helped by what I may say next. Some are saying, well, this prophet, his handling of information is very poorly and lacking. And they use this, that when Israel became a nation, 1946, he says on May the 7th, same time they were signing them, watch the word, not when they were declared as a nation, 48, when they were signing them. That's where they miss it. It says, when they were signing them, same time the angel of the Lord met me in a cave, Greens Mill, Indiana, USA. Now the critic says, oh, but they were signed as a nation, May the 7th, but then this should be May the 6th if he's in the West. Yes, there are 24 time zones. But this is what you may have missed. When he is met in the cave, it is already the next day in Israel. So he was correct. Try it. Call somebody in America right now at this very time. They are six hours behind or seven if they are on the East Coast. And they are nine hours behind if, you are, if they are in California, West Coast. Then you will see why God says, my thinking is not your thinking at all. Closing now. When the prophet saw the vision of the bride going into the rapture. Watch resonance. Watch does it ring a bell. The rapture, we are still here, but we're in the process of it. But our bodies haven't completely changed. But when he saw us, we were marching in. Here's my question. When two or three at the back of that vision, rapture march, were stepping out of line, whose voice cried out, stay in line? Without further ado, and with, without saying any more words that may spoil this sermon, watch the resonance of those words. It was a prophet's voice that kept the bride in line. And so will it be, because in spiritual amnesia, part of 206, 1964, I end with this quote, thus said the Lord, the prophet says, you are seeing your last sign. We all respect thus said the Lord now. And he said his ministry was the last sign. And we've seen it happen in Genesis 18. Elohim, Michael and Gabriel stepped down. But in Genesis 19, Two angels, two messengers proceed to Sodom. And as I close, the two messengers to Sodom have done their part and have gone home. Oral Roberts, Billy Graham are no more in this dimension. And to top it all off, even our Abrahamic ministry, the person of the prophet is no longer here, but his voice still is here. Stay in line. Does it ring a bell? Yes. Heaven sounding sweeter all the time. Thank you, Pastor Bienvenue and the congregation. Shalom.